Hi guys, welcome to the Pulse of Miami Church. Uh, if this is your first time here. You've heard of a late entrance? That's a late exit. You're yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> so if uh, this is your first time here, let me take this opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Todd Peterson. I'm the lead pastor here at this church. And one of the things that we've been doing through uh, the book of 1 Samuel... And I keep trying to remind you guys that we need to have the kind of attitude with God where we say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. If we truly want to be able to hear the voice of God, we we need to be constantly and consistently saying, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. But here's the problem. When God starts speaking to you, very rarely is he going to tell you something easy or something that you want to do. Which is, quite frankly, the reason why most of us don't, don't say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. In fact, the, the, the question that I want us to ask today, because we, we've actually seen how God called Samuel, and now last week we talked about how God called Saul. Saul was going to be the very first king over Israel. What if God calls me for something I'm not qualified for? What if I get a calling from God to do something that I'm not qualified for. And a lot of people would say, well, God wouldn't call you to do something that you're not qualified for. And um, I would say, oh yeah, every single time God has called me to do something, it was for something I was completely and utterly unqualified and unready to do. But I will also tell you this, every time God has called me and I actually went through with it, it has always been worth it. And so, uh, again, the question, what if God calls me for something I'm unqualified for? And in order to answer this question, we're going to open up to 1 Samuel chapter 10. We're going to finish up uh, chapter 10, and we're going to go through uh, chapter 11 really quick. Okay. So let me just kind of uh, catch you up. If you weren't here last week, uh, in chapter 10, we're introduced to this guy by the name of Saul. Saul was a very tall man. Go ahead and uh, stand up real quick, Roddy. So uh, he was a lot like Roddy, uh, who Roddy is, is a head above everyone else. So I stand up next to Roddy and uh, my head, he's like a head taller than me. So I'll have you stand up in a second, but you can sit down for a second. So Saul was actually uh, called by God, right? How do we know? Because Samuel, who was, who was the man of God, God spoke through Samuel. And then, just so we all know that Samuel wasn't some crazy old man... He actually said, here are three signs that are going to happen to you. And all three of those signs actually happened independent of Samuel. So we know that this is a a calling from God. In fact, one of those signs even happened in front of a bunch of people. He was prophesying uh, with with a bunch of other people. And which means uh, to sing, to speak or to sing the truths of God. And so he did that, and that was a spiritual thing that happened. So everybody knew. This guy, Saul, there's something going on with him. So uh, Samuel gathers everybody together. He goes, okay, we're going to find out who's going to be the next king over Israel. Now, a bunch of tests have already been done. We, we kind of know that it's God, but there's one more test. He's going to do what's called casting lots. Casting lots back then, uh, they were like uh, dice. You know how you roll the dice type of thing? And, and oftentimes, if, if somebody felt like God was speaking to them, if they wanted to confirm it, they would actually confirm it through the roll of the dice, right? So what are the chances that the roll of the dice says the exact same thing that God uh, said to me? And so uh, in verse 20, it says, Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near. He goes, we're, we're going to find out who's the next king over Israel by the roll of the dice, Right? And so he, he gets all the different tribes, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. So he, he rolls the dice, and, and uh, the tribe that was, that was chosen by the roll of the dice was Benjamin. Okay, so 12 tribes of Israel, Benjamin. Well, that just so happened to be uh, King, or, or not yet, Saul's uh, tribe. So then they go, okay, well, let's narrow it down a little bit more. So, so they got all the names of the different tribes. Uh, clans within the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 21, he brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans and the clan of the Matrites 
was taken by Lot. So it just so happens to be that was Saul's clan. And Saul, the son of Kish. So, so they got all the men who, who could have possibly been from that clan, the next king over Israel, and they cast lots over those names. And uh, it was the, the uh, Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. Hey, where's Saul at? Right? He's supposed to be our next king over Israel. It, this is actually hilarious. So in verse 22, they inquired again of Yahweh. They, they acquired again of God. Is there a man still to come? Like, like where, where is Saul? And Yahweh said, behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. I want you to think about this for a second. The next king over Israel, the brave king that's supposed to defend us against all of these uh, enemies is hiding in the baggage area. And so, they go and they, verse 23, they ran and took him from there. So they found him in the baggage. And uh, when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. Right? So I'm going to have Roddy stand up one more time. We're all going to call him Saul for a second. As I read this next verse, verse 24, and Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom Yahweh has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted. Help me out, guys. Long live the king. Long live the king. All right. That's as much as you get for today, Roddy. All right. So he's going to feel real good when he got us home. Where's my sandwich? No, just kidding. So uh, here's what I, I think is interesting is that at that point, they thought the fact that he was tall qualified him to be king. Now, we know today that to be a leader, you know, how tall you are doesn't really matter. But remember, they had never had a king before. They didn't know. And so, you know, there was, you know, a lot of people thought that that was a qualification, but that's not a real qualification. So, uh, verse 25, then Samuel told the people the rights and the duties of the kingship. And he wrote them in a book and he laid them before Yahweh. Well, whenever you hire somebody to do a job, you need to have a job description so that everybody has the same expectations of the person. Uh, Samuel was doing a wise thing there. And uh, Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his home. And then in verse 26, Saul also went to his home in Gibeah. With him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. And so there were some brave men who had fought who were very brave warriors, and they said, you know what, God has placed it on my heart to go and to protect our new king. Very cool. But, uh, verse 27, some worthless fellow said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present, but he held his peace. There are a bunch of people that go, that guy's completely unqualified to be king. Like what kind of a king would hide in the baggage? And they were right. They were right. He was unqualified. Saul knew he was unqualified. They knew he was unqualified. A bunch of people thought he was qualified just because he was tall, but that didn't qualify him. So the question now is, is how is an unqualified person going to respond when the, I guess the appropriate way to say it in church, when the poop hits the fan. Well, the poop is actually about to hit the fan in the next chapter. We're going to be introduced to uh, this leader of the Ammonites. The Ammonites are the, uh, the enemies of, of Israel. And I'm actually going to need help from my class, right? The class that I teach before church. I want you to tell me what you think is significant about the name of this king. Then Nachash, the Ammonite, went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. Now, for those who are in my class, does anybody find any significance in the name Nachash? It means serpent. Where else do we find Nachash in, in Scripture? Genesis chapter 3, right? So the serpent who actually tempted Eve, who, who becomes ultimately 
uh, represents the enemies of, of, of humanity, is the Nahash. So a, uh, a, a Jew who was reading this would go, ooh, Nahash, sounds like an evil guy. So the question is, is he going to live up to his name? Let's read. Then Nahash, the Ammonite, went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead, that's a Jew, uh, an Israelite city, and all the men of Jabesh Gilead said to Nahash, make a treaty with us and we will serve you. And so he, he, he uh, did a siege. So basically surrounded the city, uh, cut off all their, their supplies. They were literally starving to death inside the city. And so he had, he had effectively cut them off. And so finally they said, okay, we give up. We'll make a treaty with you. We'll serve you. We'll be, you can become our leader and we will be your slaves. Right? But that wasn't enough. For Nachash. Um, verse 2. But Nachash, the Ammonite, said to them, On this condition I will make a treaty with you, that I gouge out all your right eyes and thus bring disgrace on all of Israel. I think it's fair to say he's living up to his name. Right? So... Let, let, let's look at the motivation. Why would, why would he be interested in gouging out their eyes? Because he wanted to make a spectacle. He wanted to embarrass the rest of Israel. That Israel was so weak that they wouldn't even come and defend their own people. He was basically inviting them in for a fight. And so since the elders understood what he was trying to say... Verse 3, the elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days respite, that we may send messengers through all the territory of Israel. Then, if there is no one to save us, we will give ourselves up to you. And the only reason that, that he allowed them to do that, to send messengers, is because he wanted to challenge Israel. Verse 4, So when the messengers came to Gibeth of Saul, where Saul lived, they reported the matter in the ears of the people, and all the people wept aloud. So all the people were crying. And I love this part, verse 5. Now behold, Saul was coming out from the field behind the oxen. Isn't that great? Like, here's Saul. He's, he's the king over Israel. And the first order of business wasn't, hey, where's my crown? You know, let me get my robe. Like, I'm a, I'm, I'm, and I'm not going to embarrass her because she's going to agree with this, okay? If Magda was made queen over the pulse, the first question would be, where's my crown? Right? <laughs> Obviously. Right? It, it, same thing with my daughter. My daughter's shaking her head in agreement, right? But but he didn't care about that kind of stuff. Like we find the next thing after he becomes king, the next thing we find, he's out there, you know, behind a plow, doing hard hard labor. Now behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen. And Saul said, What is wrong with the people that they are weeping? So they told him the news of the people of Jabesh. Now what's going to happen? What's going to happen with this unqualified man who shouldn't be king? Verse 6. And the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul. And when he heard these words, and his anger was greatly kindled. Let me give you guys a little hint. If you are unqualified... But you got the Spirit of God. That's what makes the difference. Okay? Now, why was he angry? Well, because when you get the Spirit of God, when you, when you have the Holy Spirit, when you are aligned, when your heart is aligned with the heart of God, then you begin to experience the same things, the same emotions that God would have. God was angry at Nahash for torturing his children. And so all of a sudden, now Saul's heart is aligned. And while everybody else is, uh, is scared, he's angry. And so he knows that everybody else in Israel is scared. That everybody else is intimidated by Mr. Nahash. And so, verse 7, he took a yoke of oxen. He took two oxen. Cut them in pieces. And sent them throughout the territory of Israel by the hand of the messenger, saying... Whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. If you don't come out and fight, then we're coming after you and we're going to take your oxen and we're going to cut it up 
We're basically going to take your wealth away. You will have nothing left if you don't come and fight for your brothers and sisters in Jabesh Gilead. Then the dread of Yahweh fell upon the people and they came out as one man. They, they were so united as one man. Now I prefer as a, as a leader, I prefer to motivate people with uh, encouragement. But I will say this, fear is often a greater motivator than, uh, than even uh, encouragement. Verse 8, when he mustered them at Bezek, the people of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah, 30,000. So altogether it was 330,000 people showed up to fight. And so in verse 9, they said to the messengers who had come to deliver this news uh, that, that, the, uh, that Mr. Nahash was doing this to uh, Jabesh Gilead. They said to the messengers... Thus you shall say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, which is noon, you shall have salvation. So when the messengers came and told the men of Jabesh, they were glad. So when they finally got back to the, the people in the city, they told them, Hey, guess what? They're coming. They're going to defend you. And they were so glad. But now what do we tell Nachash and the, and the Ammonite army that's out there? They come out and they go, verse 10. Therefore the, the men of Jabesh said, Well, tomorrow we will give ourselves up to you. And you may do to us whatever seems good to you. If you want to gouge out our eyes, okay, fine. So, Nahash was probably a little bummed out because he wanted a fight. But hey, we won anyway, right? So, they kind of celebrated, Hey, tomorrow they're going to give themselves up. They probably, you know, that night celebrated a little bit. They all got their eye pokers out so they could poke it out. They're going to have a long day of poking out eyeballs tomorrow. Woohoo! Right? So they're just hanging out, drinking a little bit, thinking about poking out eyeballs. I don't know why that's like a fun thing for them, but it was. Okay? <laughs> and so they go to bed. And what ends up happening is Saul, with 300, 330,000 men, they march all through the night. Okay, they were so far away before that, you know, there was no way that anybody, any large army could come and rescue them by the next day. So, so that's why the people, uh, the Ammonites, didn't even care. They were like, eh, you know, nobody's coming to rescue them. It's, it's not even possible at this time. But they marched through the night. Verse 11, And the next day Saul put the people in three companies so that they could surround the camp. And they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch. Okay, so the morning watch was from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. So they come, they came in the morning. Nobody was expecting anything. Everybody's a little groggy from sleep, right? And they struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left uh, together. And so they came in, they surrounded them, they surprised them, they attacked them. Now the Ammonites must have put up a pretty good fight because uh, if the morning watch was from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., at the very least they, they fought from 6 a.m. to noon. And so that was, that was six hours of fighting, right? So it was, it was a big fight, but they ultimately crushed them. So much so that the, the, the Ammonites who survived, they couldn't retreat as, like, like as a company together. They actually just had to, to flee into the woods. I'm getting old, guys. <laughs> so in verse 12, thank you very much, Lisa. I appreciate it. Lisa's been keeping me on track today. I appreciate her. So now Saul has been successful as king. Right? Here's this guy who was completely unqualified but now he was, he was put to the test and, and he was successful, right? This was a great success. In fact, out of all of the military uh, uh, stories, the, the military battles that Israel has had up until this point, this was the greatest victory that they had had, okay? So what about those guys who doubted Saul? What about those guys who said that he was unqualified? Remember back then, if people were talking trash about the king, eventually they were, they were going to want to take power and they were going to kill the king to take power. So back then it was kill or be killed. So if people talk trash, 
Someone was going to die. It was going to be the king or them. And so in verse 12, then the people said to Samuel, Who is that? Uh, who is it that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring them in that we may put them to death. Like we don't want them trying to rebel against our king. I want you to see Saul's response. How is he going to respond as a king? Verse 13, But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day. For today Yahweh has worked salvation in Israel. Wow. He's turning out to be a pretty darn good king. Right? So verse 14, Then the old man, the old spiritual man Samuel, said to the people, Let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingdom. Verse 15, and this is our, our key verse. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before Yahweh in Gilgal. There they sacrificed peace offerings before Yahweh, and therefore Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Notice what they did at the end. They didn't go to Gilgal to, to give Saul glory. They went to Gilgal to give God glory. And that's the reason why God called an unqualified man to be the king. Because had Saul just been amazing from the very beginning, they would have said, hey, let's give all the glory to Saul. Of course, he was an amazing man. But instead, it was so clear that Saul had the Spirit of God upon him that they gave all the glory and all the honor to God. And so, if we go back to our original question, what if God calls me to do something that I'm unqualified for? The answer is this. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Let me say that one more time. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. What does that mean? God almost never calls qualified people to do things. He, he calls people who are not qualified. And then after He qualifies... Uh, um, after he calls them, he qualifies them. He gives them the Holy Spirit to enable to do the things that he's asked them to do. It kind of reminds me of, of a New Testament passage where Paul says, I boast in my weaknesses because when I am weak, he is made strong. Right? When God calls me to do things in my weakness and I'm actually successful at it, it's clearly not because of me. It was because of Him. And so He can be glorified. And that's why God does this. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. You know, when uh, God called me to be a youth pastor, it was very scary for me to do because believe it or not, I was really no good at public speaking at all. Like, I, I actually had... Um, and I still to this day, not with you guys, but when I preach in, or speak in front of groups of people elsewhere, I have stage fright. I have massive stage fright. I have to get over it every single time. Now, once I get going, I'm fine, but, but getting on the stage is, is frightening. And so if God called somebody with stage fright to preach to people every week. Like, how does that make any sense? But God has taken my weakness and He's turned it into a strength. In fact... I think if you were to talk to the staff, that, that's my only strength, right? <laughs> like, like we come into the staff meeting, I'm like, guys, I have no clue how to lead this church at all. Like, you guys got to help me. I can preach, but you guys got to help me with everything else. Because when I'm weak, he's made strong. God doesn't qualify. He qualifies the call. God called me to be a church planter. And you know what I was, I, at that time I had been a youth pastor for 10 years, so I knew how to preach. I knew how to counsel with people. I knew the Bible pretty well. But I didn't know how to do business stuff. I didn't know how to uh, uh, look at uh, contracts and, and the whole, uh, you know, and negotiate. And, and I was terrified of it. But I, I'm going to tell you today, uh, after I finally said yes to God, and that was my weakness, um, now I loathe negotiation. In fact, if you're going to go buy a car, Please bring me with you. I love arguing with people. It's the best. Right? God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. So what does that mean for your life? Well, perhaps God is calling you to share the gospel with somebody. 
You say, but Todd, I, I don't know enough of the Bible. God doesn't qual- call the qualified. He qualifies the call. But Todd, I, I'm, not, I'm not really good at, at sharing my faith with people. It's okay. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. I'll never forget there was a story from, from a man from my old church. And this is back when uh, churches used to go visit people in the neighborhood and stuff like that. It's kind of creepy these days, but back then it was kind of welcome. Remember when like, when people would knock on your door and you were actually excited about it? That, that's, that's when it would actually happen, right? And so, um, so this one guy, he was learning how to, how to uh, share the gospel and he was so excited. He had practiced and practiced and practiced. And he went with a guy who was more experienced. And he tells this story and he goes, I, I went and I sat down to share the gospel with his family. You know, they were open, they were receptive. So he shares the gospel. He, he does the whole thing. And he says, and I messed it up so bad. I made no sense. I was stuttering. I went from here to there to there, back to here. Like it was, it was, it made absolutely no sense. And he says, and he got to the end and he was embarrassed to ask the question. Because it was one of the questions he was supposed to ask. Would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? And the people said, yes, we would. And he's like, really? <laughs> like, that, like that makes no, I, I made no sense, right? And the, and the whole family accepted Christ that day. And they walked outside and he goes to, to the guy who was the leader, the, the, the more experienced guy. And he goes, hey, um, was it just me or did that make no sense? And the leader goes, yeah, it was, that was really bad, right? He says, what you have to understand, it's not about you. It's about God. And the Holy Spirit has been speaking to that family before we even came here. And God used you, not because you're awesome, but simply because you were willing to go. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. I had the same exact experience. I don't know if you remember this, Raul. I was thinking about you as I was preparing this. There is my worst sermon that I ever preached in my entire life. It was on a Friday night. I was at the youth. I was still learning how to preach. And it made no sense. It was one of these things. And I even just stopped preaching. I just, I just got off the stage. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> People came up. Like, like the band came up and they were playing. And they were like, we don't know what's wrong with Todd, you know. And I just, I went and I hid. And there was a conference room right there. Yeah, and I was like, I was in the luggage, right? <laughs> Oh, wait, where's that little bit there? No, just kidding. Uh, so, so then afterwards, Raul comes in and he goes, uh, some of the kids want to, a couple of kids want to talk to you. And I went outside and, and two of the kids came up to me and said, Ty, uh, you really spoke to me. <laughs> That's just the I was like, what did I say exactly? <laughs> but I, I learned something more than those kids learned that day. It's not about me. It's about him. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. So if God has placed it on your heart to, to share the gospel with somebody, do it. Just show up. Right? If God calls you to a new job. Maybe He's calling you to take a risk somewhere. And you don't, and you're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't feel qualified. Hey, listen, it's okay. If God is calling you to do it, just do it. Because at the end of the day, he, He's not going to call you if you're qualified. He's going to qualify the call. Finally, maybe God is calling a couple of you here to preach and teach in our church. You know, I've um, one of the things I've, I've wanted to do as a pastor for years now is, is to develop a small preaching team of just a, a handful of, uh, of guys, right? And that one once a month, uh, I would actually have one of the people from the preaching team that would, would actually preach. Maybe for a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason is it'd be great as a pastor to just be fed on a Sunday morning, right? But then also, on top of that, if God were to call one of those, those people somewhere else, that we would actually be sending off somebody who was used to preaching. How cool would that be? And I've been wanting to do it for a while, but here's the thing. It's a lot easier for me just to preach than to teach somebody else how to do it. But God has been placing it on my heart that in January, I need to start a preaching team. And perhaps God is calling a few of us here to be a part of that. Here's the qualifications. God must call you and you must be utterly unqualified to do it. 
Because God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. Let's go ahead and uh, read this, uh, this verse from Jesus, Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. Help me out with this, guys. He replied, <coughs> Blessed, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, I pray that, that we would understand that your calling is not a calling of qual- qualification. It's, it's not because I'm good enough. It's simply a calling to be a part of what you're doing. Lord, I pray that that you would humbly call us to do things that we're uncomfortable to do. Lord, the the more that we say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, the more I believe you're going to call us to do things that are difficult. Lord, perhaps there's some people in this room who you've already been calling them and they've been saying no because they're not feeling qualified. Lord, I pray that you've spoken to them today. And I pray, Lord, that maybe even shaking because they're so scared that they would finally say yes to you, Lord Jesus. It's so ironic that that saying yes to Jesus is not something that we do when we accept you as our Lord and Savior. But even, Lord Lord Jesus, when you ask us to do these things, it's, it's it's almost like becoming a Christian all over again. It's... It's struggling through and it's finally surrendering and saying, Okay, Jesus, this doesn't make any sense, but I say yes to you today. Church, are you willing to say yes to Jesus, even if he asks you to do something? That scares the living daylight out of you. Because that's the kind of people that God is looking for. Those who are willing to say yes, even though we're scared. Lord, we thank you that you're not a God who calls the qualified, but Lord, because we would be giving glory and honor to those people. But Lord, you always qualify the call. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.